Well, hallelujah. Ha hey, happy Easter to you. Look at your neighbor and say, happy Easter. Somebody said, he is risen and I am hisen. <laughs> Praise God. Well, this is what it's all about, isn't it? Easter Sunday is what it's all about. He got up out the grave, and that gives us a hope. Hey, look at your neighbor and say, he's alive. Yes, he is. You know, I'm looking out over this congregation. Y'all are a good-looking bunch of people. Give yourselves a hand for being such a good-looking bunch of people. Good-looking group of people. Take your Bibles and go to John chapter 19. I got stuff everywhere up here today. John chapter 19. And I'm going to just pick one little picture out of the whole uh, Easter story. Just one little picture here in John chapter 19. Uh, the crucifixion is going on. Jesus is hanging on that cross. And in verse 23, it says, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier of heart. Also his coat, and also his coat. And now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, on this Easter Sunday morning, I pray that you meet us in a special way. I pray that when we go out of here today, the revelation that you are alive and that you are our King of kings and Lord of lords will be burned deep into our spirits. And everyone that wants to receive that would say amen. amen. Look at these soldiers. Jesus is hanging on the cross. And there, if you, if you allow me to use the terminology, they're playing games at the foot of Jesus' cross. They're playing games. They're there rolling the dice to cast lots for his vesture. They're, 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 they're totally, they're not even cognizant of what's happening around them. They're, they just got their focus on, on, on winning his coat, on winning that coat, on winning this piece of clothing, on winning that piece of clothing. Imagine the scene, if you will. These soldiers are huddled in a circle. Jesus is up on the cross. Their eyes are turned downward toward the ground, and the criminal above is forgotten, and they gamble for some used clothes. They're gambling for a, a tunic or a cloak or some sandals, and it's all up for grabs. And each soldier is laying his luck on the ground as he rolls the dice, and he's hoping to expand his wardrobe at the expense of a cross-killed carpenter. And I wonder what this scene must have looked like to Jesus as he looked from the cross down past his bloody feet at that circle of gamblers hoping to win his coat. And what must he have thought? What emotions must he have felt? Jesus himself must have been amazed that they were there at the foot of his cross and they were playing a game just to see what they could win. Here they were, common soldiers, witnessing the world's most uncommon event, and they didn't even know it. They weren't even aware of it. It's just another Friday to them. See, every Friday they, 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 they crucified people by the hundreds, by the thousands. And so this was just, a, just another Friday. It was just another criminal up on the cross. I can hear them as they say, come on, come on, roll the dice. It's my turn. Roll the dice. It's my turn. Hurry up, hurry up. We're casting lots this time. We, this is for his sandals. This is for his, his cloak. Come on, hurry up, hurry up. Their eyes are down. The cross is forgotten. You know, they didn't even realize that over in Psalms 22, they were fulfilling the Scripture. Because Psalms 22 says it uh, plainly. He says, uh, says they, uh, to begin with, Psalms 22 starts out with, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The very words that Jesus said on the cross about the time that it turned midnight at high noon. 
Jesus says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then, and then in the same chapter there, in verse 18, it says, they part my garments among them, and they cast lots upon my vesture. They parted my garments, and they rolled the dice to see who could get my coat. And here these soldiers are fulfilling that scripture. I just can't imagine you could be so cro- close to the cross and, and not see it. The symbolism is striking. The symbolism is very striking. We who claim our heritage at the cross oftentimes playing games at the foot of that cross. So close to the timber, but so far from the blood that saves us. And we get saved and we think it's about being in competition. It's about selfishness. It's about personal gain. It's about prosperity. It's about what can we get? What can we achieve? What can we do? And, 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 and we don't like what somebody else did, so we take the sandals that we want at church and we walk off and we go find another church. Are we forgetting who it is upon that cross? Are we so focused on what's going on that we don't see the cross this morning. They didn't see the cross. They were too busy playing games. And, and here's the thing. Here, here's the number one thing I want you to realize that they missed on that cross. They missed upon that cross. It was passed over Eve. On that cross was the ram that was called in the thicket. On that cross was Isaac's substitute, Abraham's substitute. It was passed over Eve, see. And on Passover Eve, uh, annually, Every family, every Jewish family would bring a little lamb. They were lambs being sacrificed by the hundreds of thousands. They'd bring a little lamb. It had to be spotless. It had to be flawless. And they would sacrifice that little lamb for their family. And that, the blood of that lamb would be an atonement, a covering for the sin of their family for another year. Each family would bring its little lamb. This little lamb was different, though, because your Bible says he was tempted in all points like as we, yet without sin. Aren't you glad yet without sin was tagged onto that scripture? So each family brought its own little lamb. There were people on the sides of the road, the historians tell us, that sold little name tags. And they would, uh, each family would have their name, they'd have a little name tag that they would put around the neck of that lamb. And when they sacrificed that lamb, it went for that family's name tag. And if the, if the name was too long, I read, if the name was too big to get on a, they, they, what they would do is they would, they had a code, they would, they would read they, I, I'm not a Jew, so it's hard for me to understand it, but the best I can tell you is what, how, how I read it. They would read, they would code it, they would read the first letter of every word, and then that letter was a code that would spell out the name of the family, if that makes sense to you. If it don't, go look it up and study it out for yourself. And so they had the little name tags, and they had the, little, the name of the family was hanging on the lamb. Do you know over in, in John, remember over in John, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they looked up and they seen where Pilate had wrote, King of the Jews, and they said, no, 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 don't, don't, don't write that. Said, right, he says, King of the Jews. The reason that was is what uh, Josephus and the historians tell us, that when you looked up in it, and, and they did the code, and they took the first letter out of each word where it says, King of the Jews, it spelled Jehovah. <laughs> so they looked up, and Jehovah had his family lamb upon the cross. And they said, no, 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 don't say that. Jehovah, no, because they wouldn't even say that word, Jehovah. And, and Jehovah had his, I said, maybe I need to say that again. Jehovah had his family lamb upon the cross. Yes, he did. Jehovah had his family lamb upon the cross. Paul said it this way. He said, even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. They didn't see the Passover. It was Passover night. They didn't see the Passover. Isaiah said he was as a lamb led to the slaughter, yet he opened not his mouth. The Gospel of John, John looked up and seen him coming one day, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. In the Greek there, it says, Just taketh away the sins of the world. Somebody that will bear the burden, like, like, like big coal sacks, put it on their shoulder and walk off with it. He came down to Calvary's cross. He flicked up the sin of the whole world and threw it on his shoulder and said, I'll be back in three days. i got to go down through the middle of hell and make fun of the devil, and then I'll be back. Isaiah chapter 53 said he was numbered with the transgressors and he bare 
the sins of many. The word there, bear the sins of many, says this, to carry the sin as a substitutionary representative. He substituted and represented you. He carried your sins as a substitutionary representative, and, and, and it means that he can look you in the eyes and guarantee you it's going to be okay. Let me tell you something. Jesus can look you in the eye and tell you it's okay because I can promise you that I carried your sin 2,000 years ago and you're no longer responsible for that sin. If you'll get up under my blood, and get your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, let me look you in the eye and guarantee you it's going to be okay. It's what Jesus would say to you today. They didn't even see the sin of the whole world as it was laid on that lamb that was up on that cross. Every sin that was ever committed was laid on that lamb. And he cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And they're playing games at the foot of the cross. They didn't even see what was going on. They're playing games at the foot of the cross. But over in Revelation chapter 5, that same lamb that they couldn't see, they cried in heaven, the lamb that was found worthy to loose the seals. So he got recognized as the Lamb of God. They didn't even see, the second thing they didn't see is they didn't see the blood that flowed down Calvary's cross. You say, Brother Steve, how could they not see the blood? Well, they may have saw the blood, but they didn't recognize that there was something special about this blood. I'll say it again in case you don't understand. There was something special about this way. Paul said it. Paul said it in Ephesians chapter 2. He said, you who were sometimes far off are made nigh by the blood of Jesus. Peter said, we're redeemed with the precious blood of the Lamb as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. How about this? In Revelation chapter 5, they sung a song and they said, he hath redeemed us to God. By his own blood. He has redeemed us to God by his own blood. And I wrote this down last night because I wanted to be able to remember to say it just like it is. He has redeemed us to God by his own blood. Listen in the Greek what it says. The word redeemed there says if someone who went into the slave market and caused the slave to be released with the receipt of a ransom that had been paid. <laughs> it's, it's thus the purchaser had full right of possession of the one he had purchased. Have you given him a full right of possession in your life? He went into the slave market, and it says this, it's the idea that Christ paid the price required and thus removed the sinner's responsibility to pay it. Church, that's some good stuff right there. Christ paid the price required and removed your responsibility to pay it. He paid a price he didn't owe, and I owed a price I couldn't pay. But thank good God Almighty, he went into the slave market and said, Look, I got the receipt right here. Give him up. In Colossians chapter 2, it says, He went down and spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly. And that's where he went into the slave market. He spoiled principalities and powers. He kicked their legs out from under them, knocked them down, paralyzed them, held them still, pulled out a receipt and said, I done paid the price, boys. Go back up and look at the blood on Calvary's cross. I done paid the price. Now let them go. And he took captivity captive. Went, I just like that. Just went into the slave market. There's a, as y'all know, I spend a lot of time in Charleston lately, and there's a, uh, there's a, an old market down there that, that they call it was the slave market. And I can imagine, if I can imagine, if a man could could walk into there on the day that they was having a sale of slaves, if somebody could walk in and say, "Hey, hold up, hold up, I just paid." The price for all of them. Now, every one of you, every one of you slaves that are in here, you're free. Go home. Jesus paid the price 2,000 years ago for every one of us. And the Bible says, whom the Son has made free is free indeed. Sounds like a good name for a church, don't it? Set free. Whom the Son has made free is free indeed. Because he went by the slave market and paid the price. Aren't you so glad? You couldn't have paid the price. You couldn't buy yourself out. There's nothing you could do. You were bound for hell till Jesus showed up and paid the price. 
The priest would take the blood of the Passover lamb once in a year there, and he would take it into the mercy seat, and he would sprinkle the blood from your family's lamb onto the mercy seat. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 12 says of Jesus, by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained an eternal redemption for us. I don't know in my mind's eye I can see because remember, remember after the uh, after the at the tomb when when well, I'll be so glad when God heals me one day I don't have to deal with this <laughs> deal with this patch up here. But but uh, the, the, do you remember at the tomb he uh, Mary came and seen him? She said, Ravonna, Ravonna. He said, Don't touch me. He said, Don't touch me for I have not yet ascended to my Father. What was that about? Don't touch me. I haven't yet ascended. As the high priest would gather up the blood, I mean, as the high priest would take the blood of that lamb and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and sacrifice it, Jesus was to gather up every drop of his blood and take it into the heavenly tabernacle and put his blood on the mercy seat in the heavenly tabernacle for you and for me. Listen. He gathered up a drop of blood with your name on it symbolically and took it into the mercy seat and sprinkled it on there and said, Brian, few you covered. Landon, few you covered. Barry, Don Webb, you covered. I got you. I, I can look you in the eye and I can guarantee you it's going to be okay. I paid the price for your sin. I shed my own blood and I set you free. Go home and walk in freedom. Amen. You got to love a Savior like that, don't you? You got to love a Savior like that. That's why your Bible says it. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Revelation tells you that you're overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of his testimony. You're overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of his testimony. He gathered up that blood. He took it to the mercy seat, laid it on the mercy seat in heaven's tabernacle. That's why you, just like on Passover Eve in the book of Exodus, that's why now you can walk into your children's bedroom and you can raise your finger toward heaven and you can say, Devil, I cover these children in the blood of Jesus. You will not cross the bloodline. You can't touch my family because if I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he'll save me and my household. You can't touch my children. You can't, listen, you can't cross the bloodline and have my health. You can't have my finances. You can't have my sanity. You can't mess with my mind because I'm covered in the blood of Jesus. If you haven't figured that out, sometimes you need to try it. You just need to walk through your house and lift your hands and just pray and say, the blood of Jesus has got this, devil. The blood of Jesus keeps me whole. The blood of Jesus keeps my mind right. The blood of Jesus is going to see that my family say, the blood of Jesus keeps the devil off of me. The angels of God are encamped round about those who fear the Lord. And the blood of Jesus tells the devil, he he can't cross the bloodline. Now get back out of my property. Get off of my land. Get out of my family. The blood of Jesus. But they were playing games at his feet. And they didn't even see that blood of Jesus. They didn't realize that his blood was different from any other blood. I tell you something else that they didn't see as they were playing games. They didn't see the stripes on his back. Oh, they realized that they were there. They were experts at torturing. They were experts at flogging. They were experts at taking that cat of nine tails and whipping a man till he was almost a bloody pulp and almost dead. They, they were experts at that, but they didn't realize this time that these stripes were different. In Isaiah chapter 53, uh, in verse, uh, verse 4, it says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. I'm going to give you time to turn there. I want you, I want you to turn there. Get your vows. Look at this. In, in Isaiah 53 and 4. He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Watch this. Surely he hath borne our griefs. In the Hebrew, it says, Surely he bore he carried off it's it's the uh, it's the picture 
of the scapegoat. You know, you know the story of the, of the two goats in the Old Testament, where they would lay the, they would lay, they'd let one go, they lay the sins on the back of a scapegoat, and they let him go out into the wilderness. And symbolically, he was carrying the sins of that nation on his back. Surely he had borne. Surely he had worn. Surely he became the scapegoat. Surely we laid everybody's sins on his back, and he carried them out of the camp. Surely he hath borne our, what's the word there? He had borne our griefs. The word griefs are surely he had borne, our, listen to this, he hath borne our disease and sickness. That's for your wife and for me. Surely he has carried away. He, he, he carried away. The stripes on his back said, I'm carrying away your sickness and your disease. Surely he had borne our sickness and disease. And watch this. And carried our sorrows. The word sorrows there is, is our pain and, and our, our sorrow, our physical pain and our mental anguish. Surely, let's go back up and look at it. Surely he had borne our grief. Surely... He hath carried off our disease and sickness, and he carried, our, he carried our pain, our physical and mental anguish. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God. He was wounded for our transgressions, verse 5. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we, what's it say? We are going to be healed. We, we might be healed. We someday will be healed. We know it. Present tense. We are healed. They didn't see upon that cross because they were too busy playing for what they could gain. They didn't see his sickness and disease lost its hold. They didn't see it. They, they didn't understand the scriptures were in Exodus where God said, I am the Lord that heals thee. I'll, and in another place he said, I'll take away sickness from the midst of you. And Jeremiah when he said, I will restore health unto you, and I will heal you of your wounds. I'm claiming that scripture, church. I will, I will bring health, and I will cure them, and I will let them enjoy peace and truth, all because of those stripes. And you know what? They didn't realize that that was taking place at that very moment. At that very moment, because of the stripes on his back, that was being fulfilled. They didn't realize it. Because of the stripes on his back, there is a day and there's coming a day where you and I will live in eternity. And the Bible says, God shall wipe away all tears from our eyes. There will be no death. There will be no sorrow. There will be no crying. Neither should there be any more pain. There will be no undertaker because the upper taker is going to put him out of business. There will be no funeral homes. There will be no graveyards. There will be no hospitals. There will be no cancer wards. There will be no heart unit. There will be, no, be no prisons. There will be no drug rehab homes. I'm sorry, Jennifer, to put you out of business, but we won't need you in heaven, honey. There will be none of that because he will wipe away our tears and the curse will be ripped off of us. They didn't see those stripes on his back. They had no idea that they were there. They didn't understand. I tell you what they didn't see upon that cross. They didn't see the brazen serpent. Say, what you talking about? Remember the story in the Old Testament? Israel got up under a curse and, and uh, serpents, fiery serpents were biting them in the wilderness. You know, if you read your Bible, there's some really cool stories in the Old Testament. I mean, in this book, it's, it's, about, it's, uh, it's about donkeys talking. Think about it. And, 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 and God's using roosters to preach. And, and, and there's some cool stories. There's some love stories in here that beyond anything you can imagine. There's some cool stuff in the Old Testament. And, 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 uh, and, and, and here we see this story where snakes are going in and biting them. And they're dying from it. And they cried out to God. And God said, if you'll make the image of a brazen serpent and put it up on a pole, and when one of you gets bit, if you'll look up at that serpent, if you'll look at the very thing that's bit you, you'll live. In John chapter 3, and verse 14, Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. If they had a good look at the serpent that bit them, 
They was free from the back. The death of, Jim, of Jesus was the remedy for the bite of sin. There is life in one look at the crucified Savior. Because, listen, he who knew no sin became sin, that you could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. One look at him and you live. Think about it. One look at him and you live. But they were too busy playing at the foot of the cross. And all it would have taken was one look and they would have lived. If they'd have looked up, here's what they would have seen. They would have seen the lily of the valley. They would have seen the bright and the morning star. They would have seen the altogether lovely one. They would have seen one that the Bible says there's not a spot in thee. They would have seen one who is like the scent of a thousand springtime gardens. They would have seen the day spring from on high. They would have seen the horn of our salvation. They would have seen the mediator, the umpire of our life. They would have seen the strength of our life. And the Bible says, of whom shall we fear? They would have seen the light of your life, of whom the Bible says, of whom shall I be afraid? They would have seen the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. They would have seen river waters, rivers of waters in a dry place and a high tower to run into. And if you run into that high tower, the Bible says you're saved. They would have seen our refuge and our strength. They would have seen the root and the offspring of David. They would have seen the all in all. They would have seen our Savior. They would have seen our sanctifier. He is our Holy Ghost baptizer. They would have seen our divine healer. They would have seen our soon coming king. They would have seen the captain of our salvation. They would have seen the Lord of glory. They would have seen the fullness of God bodily. They would have seen the fullness of him that filleth all in all. They would have seen your everything. Listen, they would have seen him that when the enemy comes in like a flood, he raises up a standard against him. But they were too busy playing games at the foot of the cross. And they didn't see none of it. There he was, the first Adam, the anointed, the apostle, the author, the amen, the alpha, the ancient of days, the beginning, the begotten, the branch, the red of life, the bridegroom, the bright and the morning star, the vicious of our souls, the brightness of the Father's glory. But they didn't see none of him. Our captain, our consolation, our chief cornerstone, our counselor, our covenant, our chosen of God, the Christ. But they didn't see none of it. Our deliverer, our day spring, our day star, our door, our desire of all nations, the elect, the ensign, the everlasting father, Emmanuel, but they didn't see none of it. The fullness of faith, our forerunner, our friend, our first fruits, our faithful witness, the fountain of life, but they didn't see any of it. He was the gift of God, the governor, the guide, the glorious Lord, but they missed him. He was our help, our hope, our husband, our horn of salvation, the head of the church, the heir of all things, the high priest, hell's dread and heaven's wonder and our holy one, but they didn't see none of it. You know why? Because they were playing games at the foot of the cross. <laughs> this morning, there's nothing I want anymore than the one who's hanging on that cross, or hung on that cross, should I say. Nothing that I want more. Let me tell you something, church. This is not a, a, like they thought it was. This is not a game that we play. This is not just something that we do because it's our culture. This is a reality. Until you get to the place that Jesus Christ is a reality in your life, to where he's the light of your life. To where when you breathe his name, you know he's listening. If you, if you can't go back and say, I've got a relationship with him where I know as my guarantor, he, I, he looked me in the eye and said, I've got this for you. If, you. if you can't go back and say, his spirit bears witness with my spirit, and I know the day that he wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. How many of you can remember the day that that blood of Jesus cleansed you and washed you and you got up clean and whole? Yes. Easter's not about a bunny. 
Last night I was at my mother's house and one of our little granddaughters, she's two years old, my mother, she's here, started singing, here comes Peter Cottontail, hopping down the bunny trail, shaking his bunny tail, and she'd go, shaking his bunny tail. And so I got to see it, see it just to watch her, and she'd do it every time. She'd shake her bunny tail. But this is not what Easter's about. It's not about some rabbit. <laughs> Where's the rabbit in the gospel? It's not about a chocolate egg, even though I enjoy them chocolate eggs. That's not what Easter's about. It's not even so much about the fact that Jesus died on the cross, even though that's what it took. Easter's about the fact that on the third day he got up. And and at the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he shall also quicken your mortal bodies. It's twofold truth there. That spirit of God quickens me now and talks to me now and guides me now and leads me now. But it also means this. And you remember Steve Vaughan told you this. One day y'all take me out and lay me down in the grave and throw dirt on me. But the spirit of God that's down on the inside of my bones, when the trumpet sounds, it's going to quicken my mortal body. And I'm going to jump up out of that grave. You'll jump up out of that. Hey. If I wasn't so weak, I'd shout and jump on one foot up here, but I'll save that for later. Have you lost your focus? Aaron, you guys can come on and we'll finish a few minutes early. Have you lost your focus? Somebody say, God bless a preacher that'll quit early on Easter, right? Are we serving God, but have we lost our focus? And are we looking down at what we can gain? I don't know about you, but I'm tired. I'm weary of hearing nothing but prosperity, 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 prosperity. I believe in the prosperity of God. I live in prosperity. We should, but I'm sick to death of hearing that's all you can hear is prosperity, prosperity, prosperity. How about letting me hear some Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Talk to me about the one that's the baptizer in the sweet Holy Ghost. Talk to me about what it means to have fire shut up in your bones. Talk to me about this Savior, this soon coming King. Talk to me about what it's going to be like one day when the trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ rise first and we which are alive remain will be caught up together with them. And to, talk to me about it. Talk to me about my first day in heaven. Talk to me about what it's like. Talk to me about what it's like when we all gather together and the whole family of God is there together. And your loved ones that you haven't seen in years and years are there looking young and healthy. And they hug you and kiss you. And they say, thank God you made it. Talk to me about that. This thing is real. And, and you know what? There's more to it than what we can get at the foot of the cross. There's what's actually hanging on the cross. That's what I want. I want it to be real. I want Jesus to be real in your life and in my life. Yes. Look at your neighbor and say, I know you're not playing games at the foot of the cross now. No. We're not playing games at the cross. I saw some things, uh, uh, George Varner group, did a research, and uh, I'm trying to make sure I got the numbers right. But I think that it has dropped now. With each generation, it drops of those who identify, the percentage of those who identify themselves as born-again evangelical Christians. And uh, it, has dropped, it has dropped now down to in the, the low, I can't remember the exact number, but in the low 40s. 40% of Americans identify themselves 
is born again Christians. Church, our nation is headed for trouble. We're headed for trouble. Do you know, when I was in the 50s, I was born in in the 50s, and when I was born in the 50s, 96% of America identified as born-again evangelical Christians. And just in my lifetime, it went from 96 down to 40, I think 43, 44% that identifies Christians. My wife and I were in Charleston this week, and God loved their soul. I don't hate on any sinner because of their sin, because all, all of us are sin. You know, there's a thing going around today that says love is love. Well, let me tell you something. Sin is sin, and any sin sends you to hell. But, but uh, my wife and I were, were in Charleston. It's a, it's a big park there on the river right below the hospital where I've been having to go. And uh, uh, we, were, we were just sitting there. We, 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 we wanted to get some seafood while we were in Charleston. And so I took her to McDonald's and bought her a fish sandwich. <laughs> True story. But, but I'm kind. I bought, I bought her two of them, and I bought me two of them. I ate two. She didn't eat but one. But, uh, but uh, we're sitting there at the park eating our seafood. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and Donna says, "Look, and here's two grown men holding hands like they're sweethearts, just walking across the park there." And I looked at her and I said, "Did you ever think in our lifetime that we would see that so open?" And and if you're watching by TV or by video, uh, we're not hating on you. Your, your sins no worse than a, I mean, a, a, an adulterer go to hell, a, a drunkard to go. I mean, sin is sin. But uh, when this one's so open, it's in your face. I never thought we'd see that. I never thought there'd be less than 50% of America that claims to be Christians. If that happened in my lifetime, what's going to happen in young Landon's lifetime? What's going to happen in your children and your grandchildren's lifetime? Let me tell you something. The church, we've got to get our eyes off what's going on at the foot of the cross, pushing for selfishness and pushing for prosperity and pushing for greed and gain and personal wealth. We need to get our eyes off of that. And get our eyes on the Savior that's on the cross. We, we, we need to go back and look at the blood that was shed on the cross. We need to see the brazen serpent that's on the cross. We need to see the stripes that was laid on his back. We, listen, we need to go back to preaching the gospel. Not this new age stuff. We need to preach the raw. The real gospel will offend you. The real gospel will hurt your feelings. The real gospel will make you uncomfortable with yourself. The real gospel will make you realize, I can't stay the way I am. There's something about, you know, I I looked at my wife, that story in Charleston, go back to that. I looked at my wife and I said, and I realized my generation, I said, there must be something wrong with me because every time I see that, I don't want to go beat somebody up. She said, no, you should love them. You should love them. The church, listen, sin has its hands around the neck of our society. And it's squeezing the very life out of us. And it's doing it so slowly that we haven't even realized it. It's squeezing a little tighter. It's squeezing a little tighter. Squeezing a little tighter. question is, what would God have us to do? Pray and fast and get in our word and say, God, heal our country. And God, start with, to heal our nation, start with healing me. Heal me first. Deal with me first. And then deal with our nation.